Hello and welcome to this month's video podcast in radiology. I'm David Kalmus, Deputy Editor for Neuroradiology. Today I'm joined by another Deputy Editor, Albert DeRoos, who does cardiovascular imaging. We're speaking today with Kevin King regarding his recent paper entitled Cardiovascular Risk Factors Associated with Smaller Brain Volumes in Regions Identified as Early Predictors of Cognitive Decline. Dr. King is Assistant Professor of Radiology at University of Southern California. And Kevin, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So to get started, um, this study was focused on data from the Dallas Heart Cohort Study. Right. I think it would be useful for our readers and viewers to understand a little bit about that study, um, the aims of it, and what the current status is. Okay, sure. So the Dallas Heart Study, it's a large population-based study that, um, as the name implies, was meant to look at cardiovascular disease. Uh, the size of the cohort um, originally started at looking about 6,000 people that got 3,000 of the people um, imaged with just cardiovascular imaging, um, maybe almost two decades ago now. And uh, the main um, part of organizing a study like that isn't just the numbers, but the way they sample people, they try to do something similar to how a political poll might sample people so that whenever you study a group of 3,000 or 2,000 and you see a certain incident of disease, you can then take that larger and say that's what the incidence of disease is in the entire county that we're studying, so in a large major metropolitan center. So it's more than just getting um, a lot of power, it's also getting very accurate data of um, how significant different insults are in the population at large. So it's not enriched at all for people with vascular disease. It's really trying to make the sample um, as much as possible like the larger um, sort of population that you're studying. And originally it was, um, it was started to try to address um, disparities where there was very little African American involvement in some of the larger original heart studies. So it had a um, sort of disparities focus um, from the beginning, so it's had oversampling for African Americans. And um, beyond being sort of ethically important to do that, I think there's also um, a lot of um, good scientific reasons for doing that. I work now um, with the Alzheimer's uh, Disease Research Center at USC, and um, now that we're starting to learn that vascular risk factors probably play a, a bigger part in causing dementia than we thought before, there's a problem that a lot of these Alzheimer's disease centers have really more well-educated, higher socioeconomic status people that are participating. So the, um, the level of vascular disease in the Dallas heart is a lot higher than what you would see in these cohorts. You have people that have more hypertension and more diabetes, and also people that have less access to care. So there's a problem of if you look at the different populations, I think you can underestimate the impact of vascular disease. If you're looking in a convenience cohort from a major academic center versus if um, you invest in it really is a lot of time and effort to try to go out into the community and bring people in that maybe aren't reading um, you know, university newsletters or going by major medical centers and trying to bring them into the study. And um, I don't mean that to criticize the um, the major neurology studies and Cliff Jack, um, whenever he spoke to our group before, had mentioned the wide disparities in funding. So there have been a lot more money going to heart studies in the past and have been going to neurology studies. So I, I think that they've had to try to make do with how much funding they've had. But going forward, um, I think it'd be really important to start, and people are doing this, start getting a lot of um, good data about brain health from some of the major heart studies. It's interesting that the Alzheimer's studies are funded out of National Institute of Aging and not uh, Neurologic Disease and Stroke Institute. In any event, so tell us, for, for this current paper, what was your research question um, and uh, what did you find? So the main question was um, to look at three areas that had gotten a lot of interest as far as early predictors, um, early predictors of Alzheimer's disease, although I just left it as early predictors of later cognitive decline. In my description for the paper, um, and try to see for these three key areas that people had a lot of attention to, if we can see changes much earlier on um, related to vascular disease. Um, so 
Um, the, the point there would be to see if they were having a big impact, vascular disease risk factors on these areas, and in the studies that had been published, um, there may have been a component of vascular disease impacting the differences in brain volumes that they had been looking at. Um, and as far as the specific hypothesis, I think um, I didn't know which brain regions the different risk factors would more correlate with, but the sort of this is sort of a beginning work and something where I'd like to see if you can establish specificity for how different risk factors um, involve different parts of the brain. So I guess the question would be, would we see a different um, impact on um, like precuneus, posterior cingulate, and hippocampus? Um, the sort of uh, counter um, theory to that is that certain brain regions are just going to be more susceptible to all types of insult. So there may not really be um, a characteristic pattern of involvement. Um, like here, I really wanted to try to see if we could differentiate different parts of the brain, starting very simple, just three areas, and see if we couldn't find um, a different profile of involvement for the three different brain areas. And then, what, uh, what data did you have to work from? So we have longitudinal um, cardiovascular risk factor data. So the, the cohort that we have is really well characterized as far as um, heart disease, glucose tolerance. The outputs we had for the Dallas Heart, I mean, the limitation we had was it was a heart study. So we had less than 10 minutes that we had available for brain imaging. And they'd bring people in, they'd do an hour's worth of scanning of the liver, the aorta, the carotids. And so the brain was pretty minimal. So this study here was based off of just the volumetric T1 data. Um, and uh, we haven't had a huge imaging analysis component. So likewise, if you're doing something like this now, like the next step might be to use a sophisticated algorithm to really recognize the pattern of involvement of different brain regions. Um, we were working from a free surf analysis, which I thought was still important. The benefit of just doing region of interest free surf analysis is it's easy to understand. If you get more complex algorithms that show patterns of involvement, it can be a little bit hard to relate to people and discuss what the findings are. Um, so there are still benefits of this simple approach. But um, starting with, I just picked three areas that are of particular interest as sort of the opening salvo into this, uh, this question. So what did you find? So um, the things that were interesting, um, one was um, finding relations with uh, differences in volumes. So this is cross-sectional. So forgive me if I sort of lapse into what I'm trying to get at, which is atrophy. But for this, we're just looking at cross-sectional differences. Um, for people below age 50, we saw um, a number of factors that were um, associated with differences in volume for the posterior cingulate and precuneus. Um, alcohol being one that came up a lot and uh, diabetes also came up. Um, the thing that was kind of interesting for me that I wasn't anticipating and maybe it was just my frame of mind was that um, HDL actually ended up being associated with um, larger volumes uh, which I wasn't really anticipating thinking about things that might have sort of a protective effect but um, this data would suggest that the HDL um, at least for some brain regions associated with higher brain volumes. Maybe it may be important with uh, maintaining brain health. And you have to be careful extrapolating the differences in volume here with outcomes. Um, some things may change volumes and they may not be responsible for the cognitive decline you see later on. So different things may produce the same sort of changes in the brain but have different meaning, at least when we're just looking at volumes. But um, that was sort of an unexpected thing for me. And so, um, I, one thing that came out of that is talking with a, a group at Dallas Heart that um, has a lot more experience breaking apart the different parts of the lipidome. And so subsequent work will try to tease that out a little bit better because it wasn't just HDL. Some of the other um, triglycerides were also associated with higher brain volumes. Um, so I think there's a lot to try to figure out there still. So Albert, I know you have a strong interest in cardiovascular risk factors in the heart and the brain, is there anything you'd like to touch on in terms of mechanistic uh, hypotheses that could be tested in a study like this? So uh, I was intrigued uh, by the uh, possible mechanism underlying this uh, interaction between the heart and the brain. So there's nowadays much interest in treating hypertension. Hypertension may affect uh, the stiffening of the aorta 
And there's also a lot of interest that heart disease and aortic stiffening may be part of the spectrum of Alzheimer's disease and that it may be to a large extent a vascular disease. So how you envision how these cardiovascular risk factors work on the biomarkers which we can image with MR like heart failure, aortic stiffening, and how that interacts with the brain. Can you speculate a little bit on this possible link? Um, sure. So the sort of most direct way that you think they might be working is causing arteriosclerosis, just leading to ischemic changes in the brain. So we have a, um, a sub-study that we just finished imaging of 70 people for the Dallas Heart, where we're going to be looking at cerebrovascular reactivity. So we have a test where we can try to look at small vessel function. And the idea there is, is that um, the assumption is that this is mediating a lot of these vascular disease impacts on the brain. Um, there's different options, and there may be a direct neuronal effect. Um, I'm looking at microvascular ischemic disease. There's a, um, also a very big push by Bereslav Zalakovich and others to say that it is microvascular disease, but it's not ischemia. I think as radiologists usually think of it, but it may actually be differences in blood-brain barrier permeability, letting things that are harmful in the blood into um, sort of the extracellular milieu space around neurons. Um, and so I came to USC now to work with uh, Meng Law and um, Krishna Nayak who have um, sort of made advances in DCE, um, just different ways of looking at gadolinium going um, in and out of membranes to try to better quantify blood-brain barrier disruption. So the, the short of it is, I think going forward, I think radiology is getting much better tools, not just looking at correlation with biomarkers, I think we're getting much better about really being able to interrogate these specific theories of how things are impacting the brain. I think the, the first thing is just to see which risk factors are important, which is what this paper was, and to see do they even have anything to do with brain changes? And if so, the other big thing is when. I mean, are these things that are happening well before onset of neurodegeneration? Are they having their own separate um, processes of change in the brain? Because so much we're looking at just before, um, right before people become demented, because you don't want to study people for 50 years. But it's important to see maybe a lot of these processes started earlier on. Um, and sort of related to this work, but um, something that was done really nicely, Cliff Jack at Mayo has some really nice work looking at how the hippocampus changes across adult lifespan. Um, I think that there's some big people in the field that are really starting to move in this direction or try to take a bigger approach as to how vascular risk factors across the lifespan are changing brain volumes. So uh, I have also an question about the possibilities for treatment of those patients because when you have these vascular hemodynamic alterations you may affect them with treatment options so some people have a somewhat positive attitude to uh, for clinical practice in this respect do you envision some practical and positive applications of these techniques for treatment options yeah so um i I think one of my best um, qualities as a researcher is I have almost unbounding blind optimism that things <laughs> that I'm doing will have some impact. But um, let me try to relate why I think these things are important. Um, uh, as you and I uh, were discussing a little bit before the broadcast began, um, one example of um, how treatment might be impacted is this current debate about what is the optimal blood pressure for maintaining health, particularly as people become older. And so you've had two different um, studies that have come out. Well, one, the SPRINT study that's looking at data, and another one that was looking at a meta-analysis for prior health data that have reached different conclusions for where target blood pressure should be. As in the, the point that um, is important for this conversation is that the outcomes for that study is looking at really large vessel ischemic disease or looking at cardiovascular disease, you're looking at heart attacks and strokes. Um, those studies haven't really been informed yet for what's the best blood pressure to stop microvascular ischemic disease in the brain and to prevent dementia. That's not really a part of those recommendations. And so the way it'll go right now, um, like it has for prior studies like the Honolulu Aging Study and others that 
showed that um, hypertension in midlife leads to dementia, um, without better imaging markers, we're just going to end up having to wait a couple of decades and seeing, okay, which blood pressures were related with more dementia and which were with less. So um, a more sophisticated approach would be to look directly at vascular function, which is what I'm focused on now, to try to get a better test of exactly what is directly the microvascular function at this point in time. So whenever you change blood pressure, you can try to assess more quickly how is that impacting the brain as opposed to waiting for the ischemic changes to become so great that you have changes in the tissue. But I still have a lot of um, respect and I think there's a lot of potential for getting much more out of just our basic volumetric T1s. And my interest there really stems from um, wanting to have things be clinically useful. So the, the metrics that we're looking at in this study are something that pretty much any center that does MRI could get these metrics. Uh, the main problem has been really having um, these companies get FDA approval. So like NeuroQuant is something out there where if you wanted to get brain volumes, you could look at them, but they don't have the full um, suite of the underlying volumes that could be available from its free surfer algorithm. So um, I think there's going to have to be um, a little bit of a change in how we practice radiology in the future. It's going to also be hand-in-hand -hand with neurology and understanding what these brain regions mean. Um, but we need to get a better idea of how risk factors like hypertension are impacting the brain, where they're impacting the brain. And then I think that will help then to guide future treatments. I, I haven't spoken about what specific treatments I think might be best. And so um, maybe I'll throw out one quick counter thing that people would say that we know treating hypertension is useful. So why do you need to study it? You just need to control it. But like this other discussion we're talking about, maybe we don't know the ideal blood pressure that people need to really have it set at. Or just to look at the experience that cardiologists and um, renal doctors have had where there may be therapies that are good for certain individuals in certain cases and not as good for others. Like a lot of these drugs, we really don't know how they're changing transmission of pulsatility to the brain. We don't know what impact they're having on the vasculature within the brain itself. So I think there's a real potential to come up with um, drugs that are more neuroprotective in the future, informed by this better understanding of the physiology. Okay, thank you for the interesting discussion. I will refer to David Kalmus for concluding this discussion. Thank you. Yeah, th thanks to both of you. It's been really stimulating. And then, like a lot of papers, it, uh, your paper seems to uh, raise as many questions as it answers, which is good. A uh, hypothesis generating paper is always a nice one to have in our journal. Um, we're very excited about your paper. Congratulations. And we hope that uh, your future studies you talked about today will also be sent to our journal for consideration. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much.